Hey, in this video, we'll be talking about PEX, which is Picture Exchange Communication System. Us, agents of speech, are not affiliated to this PEX system at all. This is just a guide for parents to learn how to use it. And obviously, some of these things may or may not work with your child. It really is up to the professional's discretion. And I'm just here to share what we see is working with the parents that we are uh, coaching. And what we see are some mistakes and downfalls when you're trying to use this okay so pex full name picture exchange communication system is quite a good thing to do for if your child is non-verbal or pre-verbal so to speak okay so the first thing is i see a lot of parents and teachers and trainers is that when they often ask about pex right is that they think that it's an alternative way for children to learn to communicate which is true but the most important part that they're missing is that pex is to teach children to initiate communication correctly. So because your child is already getting what they want and getting the needs met some way, which is most probably leading your hand, pulling your hand, pointing, vocalizing, crying, tantrum, so on and so forth. So they already have it. But the thing is to replace that current mode of communication, you need something new. And therefore, PEX is a good way to teach that. And by like exchanging a picture to get what they want, you will get rid of a lot of the hand pulling and the tantrums and so on because now they have a reliable way of getting what they want and there's a predictable way for them to to be more calm basically all right so that's the first point the second point is that pex provides context to teach other skills and we call that pre-linguistic skills basically and if you search online if you go, go into like the google rabbit hole you'll see there are like 10 or around 20 pre-linguistic skills that people therapists like myself, we outline, but I don't think we have come up with a certain list about like what they are, which ones are the most important. But I think from just the experience, imitation, right? Whether it's action or sounds, that's very important. Turn taking is also quite important, right? Joint attention is also important. Eye contact and so on are not as important that the list goes on um, i don't want to talk about this here you can research it on your own it doesn't really matter the, the place that matters is that how does this, these skills help your child communicate better right so pex provides a context for you to teach these things number one is that the one that i left out sorry is actually matching so matching is between like a 3d to 3d object they put two things together right and there was an argument made by a supervisor before is that oh everything in the world is about matching right whether it's something that you're doing like matching a cow toy with a cat, another cow that looks the same and later on can you generalize and categorize them together like a brown cow and a purple cow they go together because they're both cows right so that's a little more advanced and later on is like matching concepts is what we do all the time right making connections between two foreign concepts right those are also matching by that much higher level and that's actually what language is we're matching a word which can be written to a concept right if we remember that for instance if you're watching youtube the reason why YouTube, you can remember it, is because you is you and tube means like some sort of video, right? So it's all about semantics and if you can match, right? So PEX gives a very concrete way to map, that's the word, between a picture to a real life object or concept. Usually it's an object, okay? So PEX provides that context for your child to learn, okay? So I need to go through all of this nuances before I talk about all everything, okay? So bear with me a little bit. So you need a prompter to make things work better. A lot of times I see parents is that when they're doing it on their own, it's very difficult for them to prompt because you're not as skilled and you're not as like, you haven't done this with other children, right? So for myself, I can actually prompt it at the same time and I'll try my best to be as naturalistic as possible. The reason why we use prompters is because there should be an invisible hand at the back of the kid to uh, not to say control, but to provide prompts physically to tell them to do something. The biggest mistake we see parents and we see this like after you do this actually helps the kid a lot. So why we tell parents to not have any verbal inputs is because if you are always asking the questions before a certain behavior happens, then it might become a part of the routine. Okay, so what does that mean? Let me give you a quick example. This is especially true for autistic children. And there was a teenager that I was working with a long time ago when I was, I was just helping out at an NGO. And so the teenager didn't want to go inside of the train. And the reason was because usually when the door closes in Hong Kong, it beeps like around 20, I don't know how many times, but he's, he was counting all these years and he said, I'm not going in that, that cars, that train's got something wrong. It's when it was closing its doors, it's less than 20 times or something. That's what he said. So that 
becomes a trigger for the behavior to happen and therefore we don't want that for instance if later on if we're using packs and we we don't ask what do you want or like what what do you do now give me the card if we don't say that and the and the behavior doesn't get triggered then what do we do how do we get rid of that verbal instruction how do we fade it out it is nearly impossible right so therefore when you're starting to prompt it's much better to just be quiet and just do it and slowly fade out the prompt by like giving less and less physical touch and more and less intrusive okay and obviously you know i'm not telling you, you that you should be doing this it, it really is what we see parents are like uh, when we coach parents this is one of the best advice that we can give just be quiet and physically prompt instead of saying give me that or what do you do now like these these kind of questions are not good for the whole routine okay because there's no way that you can prompt this away what are you gonna do like you say half of the command like what do you <laughs> that's still very very unnatural so to speak okay the next point which is gonna take me some time is to be clear about the phases of pecs what they are so i'm sure you can buy the pecs manual somewhere on the internet and this is not official class for pecs uh, as well this is what my sharing is but what i want you to do is like if you can get your hands on the manual for pecs it will help you a lot and right now i'm just going to show you my screen here and this is the website that you see in the in the description below you can click there and take a look okay so pecs there are different phases okay so here you can see phase one is all about how to communicate so i see a lot of problems that when trainers talk to us is that they're doing phase one but they're not doing phase one so what, what does phase one mean it means how to communicate individuals learn to exchange single pictures single pictures for items or activities they want okay the problem is two things number one is the word single pictures okay the second word is they really want a lot of times i see parents will try to push an activity or something that the child is like meh so that doesn't work right it needs to be highly desirable that the thing so that's why when we do it with at agents of speech we always go to like the most unhealthy snacks possible uh in the beginning just to get them hooked so to speak and obviously yeah that's something we have to slowly get rid of but at the same time we want that desire to uh, to want that thing okay the second thing is single pictures how many times do i see people doing pecs in the first go with like two or three pictures just blows my mind all right you can't do that because you're teaching the context the routine do not try to teach the language first all right we're going to talk about this later if you watch some of the videos on agents of speech our, our channel you will see that we always talk about teaching the routine first. You're confusing your kid if you don't teach the context. If you, don't, you have no context and you teach the language, the language is useless. And th that's why the YouTube videos, when you teach, when, when the kids learn words from YouTube, why they're useless is because there's no context to use those words. In real life, there are no hexagons or triangles flying in the air, right? Or there's ABC that are, are jiggling around. There's none of that stuff, right? So that's why in the first phase is always to teach the pictures, first and you see in this picture if it's too small for you sorry let's make it bigger and you'll see the prompter behind helping the kid without saying anything hopefully okay so phase two is where things get a little bit more difficult so if you can read doesn't matter if you can't i'll just read it to you distance and persistence that's the, the title of it still using single pictures see still using single pictures so even phase two individuals learn to generalize this new skill by using it in different places with different people and across distances they are also taught to be more persistent communicators. Okay, what does that mean? So let me just take out the whiteboard here and I'll try my best to tell you what's going on. So for this to happen, this is you, right? This is a table. This is the card. This is phase one, right? That's your kid. That's the adult with the glasses, the prompter at the back. And to take the card and give it to you and get, get the reward, right? So that's phase one. So if, and then... Phase two is when you you form a triangle. Is that you with the reward? Let's call it reward. The card and the kid. The kid still has the prompt behind, obviously. So the distance increases. This increases. The triangle increases. The kid has to walk towards the card, come over, hand, shove it into your hand and get the reward and you give it the reward to him, right? So... This is what we call about like increasing the distance and you have to do two more things number one 
this these two need a swap right as frequently as you can and not as, as frequently as you can but you know like change it every hour or so right and how you change it is just to give the reward to someone else and you be quiet and you become the prompter and you that's why it, it makes more sense to do this in, in a therapy center because then you can have a lot of people being the person who's the communicator okay and the prompter so this is how you generalize and you do it in different rooms so you can do it in the kitchen you can do it in in the dining room and the living room and wherever okay just around the house as much as you can and then go downstairs do it outside whatever okay anywhere safe and quiet and with little distraction okay the theory is that if your child really wants the reward it doesn't matter about other distractions right so that's phase two for you all right and this is where like phase three gets more a little more spicy and what i mean by that picture description is the phase three and i see too many parents before they stop like they were telling me ming my pex is not working what's going on and the reason why is because they're doing picture discrimination too early right you're not supposed to do it you need to teach these first to make them more persistent meaning that they need to shove that card into your hands and you go oh you're talking to me let me see oh you want a cookie okay cookie and then you show the picture and uh, the item the reward and you switch through it and you switch and give it to them and then now they know that routine at the back of their head and they know how to like what exactly what you want and then you can go on to picture description so picture description the biggest thing here are two problems all right number one is that you are trying to do phase three at the same distance for phase two when we're teaching something there are two things that are we're trying to teach number one this is across for all sorts of speech and language behavioral goals, right? Number one, generalization, which means the distance, different room, different people. All right, we can put different people, people, right? And the second thing is the complexity. Sorry for my handwriting using my mouse here, right? Number one is how many cards are there? That's how, how what's the complexity of which, right? Real photo or line drawing, like, or, or even like just the abstraction of the card of the picture card so it could be a real photo it could be a it could be a drawing it could be a line drawing and the most complex is obviously just words right so it's a spectrum of complexity and the last one is not a lot of people talk about this is about like the contrast so let's say the kid is very particular about the, the brand of chips that he, he or she likes so if i say I put one Lay's and one Pringles, right? That's a different picture, but it's the same category and a very similar reward. Then the contrast is very low and you never want to use this in the beginning, right? It needs to be super high contrast, right? Uh, and the, the how you get the maximum contrast in the beginning is to use a blank card, right? And you want to decrease the generalization back to the phase one, where it's just you and the kid on the table and plus a prompter at the back, right? So you start off with chips and nothing. And I feel like the biggest problem as well, I, I, I keep on saying biggest problem. There's loads of problems when people are using packs. And the reason a lot of them, like once they understand this, they're like, oh my God, my kid's starting to like give me the card, the correct card all the time. The reason why is because when the kid picks up the blank card, the prompter or the communicator, so to speak, gives a negative feedback or gives off like like a face, like, like, like that. That's not going to help the kid because like, let me give you an example. So if, I go to a restaurant and I say the wrong thing, I will get the wrong thing, right? Let's say I wanted to eat steak, but I said chicken. So what would the waiter do? He'd, he'd give me a chicken. Would he go like, oh no, that's wrong. He wouldn't do that because that's not natural. He doesn't even know what I want. So when it's talk about pecs, I don't know what the kid wants. That's why if he gives me a blank card, I'll give him nothing. Oh, oh, you want nothing. Okay, here you go. And I give air, nothing. Okay, and then this is the other part is that after you give nothing and the kid gets a little angry, that's fine reset the whole situation don't immediately prompt him to get the chips card because what's going to happen is that he might think he might it's all about reducing the risk of doing the wrong thing all right is that you reset the situation or else the kid thinks that oh i first give you the blank card and then i give you the chips and i get the chips so what you get when you go up to like four four or six cards is that the kid gives you every card until he hits jackpot <laughs> you don't want that so you want to make it harder for him every time is that if the child is very rigid, use the rigid to our favor and make sure that the situation is, if there are choices, you give me one, you will get it, all right? If you give me more than one card, I'm gonna reset the whole thing and you have to do it again, right? So 
that's the most important thing about phase three is that the complexity level of generalization needs to be at phase one. And then you have to make maximum contrast and make it easy for a kid. Okay, that's phase three. So phase three is a discrimination. And let me just read it again. Learn to select from two or more pictures to ask for their favorite thing. These are placed in text. Communication book, a ring binder with self-adhesive hook. Right, so too many people start with the book. I don't, I don't like the book. The reason why is because it's clunky, it's whatever. I like to put it on the table first and I want to move on to like four. And then some kids we can do like five and six. The problem is, if the kid wants one, we're not supposed to know that he wants one. Because if he has communicated with us prior that he wanted one, then we don't need to use pecs already. You know what I mean? If he already pointed, he wanted that, and I wanted him to do extra steps through pecs. It, it's not natural, it's not nice. So therefore, what we need to do here that is not on the pecs manual, but I can tell you by experience, is that if he gives me one, and I'm not sure if that's something he wants, I give him, I, I present a tray, with the items one and four, and maybe we can have like a few more that helps him. That's sorry, that's a five. So to help him understand, to help him like just tell him to choose from it, to see if he understands the relationship between the picture and the real object. And is that really what he he's asking for? Sometimes the kid just gives you a random card, but hopefully when you're at six and he doesn't, uh, he doesn't give you a random card. If he gives you a random card at like six cards, what do you do? You decrease the level of complexity and you get rid of some of the cards, right? Maybe you go back to two or you go back to three. Doesn't matter until it's very consistent. That's one to one. All right. We always say in agents of speech, even if it's about gestures, which is basically the same thing as pecs, is that we always want one word, one gesture and one action. And pecs is one word, one picture, one object, right? We don't want to mix it up. If they don't understand the one-to-one -one relationship to this, it's very difficult to teach any sort of language here. Okay. And then sentence structure. So I see a bunch of people doing sentence structure far too early. We don't want to do sentence structure. It's not something that's actually helpful. Right. So I never really go up to four to five and six. And the reason is because if the kid is truly nonverbal and he requires this communication book to, to communicate, then, okay, we, we can move up to like phase six if we wanted to, right? What is something that you want to hear is that how we bridge pecs towards speech, right? How do we bridge pecs towards speech? How we do it is the same as when we are doing with gestures, when we teach parents in coaching, right? How we use it is when the card comes to you and it gets shoved into your hands, you take the card and say, oh, you want cookie. You take the cookie. Before you exchange, you ask the child to do some sort of imitation. So this imitation, it could be speech. It could be a simple sound. It could be a vowel sound ah, of, of vocalization, or it could even be just a simple action imitation, like touch your head or whatever, or touch your nose like this. Like all those are fine. The reason why is because we want to teach the pre-linguistic skill of imitation, right? So. Given that we already have a strong routine with pecs, can we use pecs to our advantage and teach imitation, right? Rather than going to phase four to six, which is like, oh, now we're going to use pecs to teach language now, we can focus back to the speech skills. So speech and language are different. If you do pecs all the way to like, I want whatever, and the therapist will tell you, oh yeah, we're working on speech too, because then you can put out the sentence strip that they choose, like, I want to eat apple. And then they take the kid's hand and go, I want to eat apple, like that, right? So, yeah, they're, they're working on speech. But at the same time, if we don't teach, like, imitation by a concept, and every time the kid will just follow us whenever we talk, then it's very difficult to get out of the packs, right? Packs is good to create a strong routine, but we need to use that to our advantage, teach imitation first. Once we have imitation, we can move on to play, right? Because um, if you look at the, the pecs phases, again, it's all about wanting. It's very structured. They can only say, I want to, whatever, right? You can make sentences all right and face five and six, right? You can say something like I see or something I hear or something I, I feel, whatever. These are cool, but at the same time, it's not really tied to a certain 
play structure like there's no play involved and when you don't have play involved it's very difficult for your child to actually want to use packs because it's cumbersome right so why we use speech instead of like packs or like aac to talk when i'm talking to you right now is because it's the most effective way right like if i could i would telecommunicate with you that would be easier than talking right rather than straining my voice and and, and and talking too much so what we need to do is to use that routine to teach imitation and then so then we can move on to other forms of communication other than requesting right and which they also talk about sentence building which is fine and also commenting we want to move on to different things all right and pex is rather limited when it comes to unless your child is really good and understands everything with pex and can like make very complex sentences the longer you go the more cumbersome it becomes and it makes more sense to move on to like an ipad like, like a more high tech based aac when we talk about ac a lot and you can just search it on uh, our youtube channel or you can listen to anyone about this okay so that's about it for this video and if you want to start home therapy you can go to agentsofspeech.com slash checklist to grab a list of tools and toys we recommend you to get when you start okay so obviously this is not an official class about packs if you have any questions put them in the comment section below we'll try our best to get to you and as always find a professional who can help you it doesn't need to be me it doesn't need to be us from agents of speech either it can be anyone that you trust and as long as you're taking action and you see that if something is working double down on it if it doesn't work then you know like think about why it's not working and try again okay that's it for this video i'll see you in the next one Bye bye